Uh, bring the knee up to the shoulder. Good. So could we have a blue acetate? So um, we think you're blue, uh, in the indicating that uh, you weaken to the blue color. Okay, pull, which is great. So our two barkers, if you remember now, are ADP from strength to see if she weakens. So ADP is like a, a flat rechargeable battery. And she does indeed weaken to that. And then from weakness, by putting the blue acetate or using any marker which would create weakness, we put a TP, a a -TP on and she strengthens. So yes, we're lucky we have got somebody who's tired, which is probably most of the population. Now, what we want to be able to do now is to have a look through glycolysis, and so we use the end product, which is going to be pyruvate. So our first challenge here is pyruvic acid. And she doesn't strengthen to that, so that would mean that glycolysis is okay. Then acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA doesn't strengthen, so we're through getting our substrate into the mitochondria. Okay, so now what we do is we do NADH. We jump now to the end product of the Krebs cycle, which is to produce NADH and FADH2. So if she strengthens to one or both of those, then we could spend our time and have a look around the Krebs cycle and study each of the pathways there, or just go for the principal nutrients. But what we've got here is an FADH2 and an NADH, which doesn't strengthen. That only leaves one place where we have our problem, and that's in the mitochondria. Now, NAD complex 1 is basically NADH. Complex 2 is basically NAD, is it basically FAD. Complex 3 is complex 3, which is a, uh, uh, a structure made with a lot of heme in it and we're going to cover heme in a minute. So we want to see if she strengthens to complex 3, which she doesn't. So now we go for complex 4, which is otherwise known as cytochrome C oxidase. Complex 4. Complex 4. No, cytochrome C is the, con is the converter. Okay, so she strengthens to complex 4, or com uh, cytochrome C oxidase. Okay, now if we're right here, what is the substrate to complex 4? The substrate is complex 3. So <laughs> let's put complex 3 on her from strength. And what we find here is she weakens. Okay? So now we pinpointed, look at this, absolutely amazing. Within a couple of tests, six or eight tests, we're now talking right down in her mitochondria of thousands of mitochondria in thousands of cells in your body and we pinpointed where it is. It's at complex 3 to 4. And that is the conversion there, carries the electrons, four electrons, from complex 3 to complex, by cytochrome C. So if you give me now cytochrome C, now cytochrome means it contains heme. So now we begin to think, ah, if cytochrome means heme, probably the nutrients that she needs are involved with heme. And heme, the same nutrients go on to make heme in hemoglobin, heme in many of the enzymes that we've seen. So what we've done is we've whittled it down to being a defect at complex 4, which means she's getting odd numbers of electrons coming in there, and we all know what that means. When you get an odd number of electrons coming into complex 4, it means you're getting superoxide, peroxide, maybe hydroxyl radicals being produced. So what we're going to do later on is we'll come back to you, because I think your problem is one involved with the production of heme. And we need to look at heme and hemoglobin and its relationships. Okay? Right, so basically what we did in the process, we did the two markers for energy, which was ADP. Does she weaken to ADP? Does she strengthen to ATP? Okay, you are all happy with that. That's how you would tell whether a person has got an energy problem. You could then work from ADP in weakness and find out what strengthens, like pyruvate, or from any marker, like the blue acetate or any weak muscle. So what I did is I worked from ADP, and then we saw whether she strengthened to pyruvate. No. Does she strengthen to acetyl-CoA? No. 
does she strengthen to NADH, the N substance of the Krebs cycle? No. Does she strengthen to FADH2, the N cycle of the Krebs cycle, N part of it? No. Therefore, it has to be the third part, the electron transport. So we tested her with complex 1, which we've already done, was NAD. Complex 2 is FADH2. Complex 3, which is made of heme, and complex 4, cytochrome C oxidase. So we were able to find that she strengthened to complex 4. That means where she can't get to. That's where the problem. So the conversion of the electrons, the carrying of the electrons, from complex 3 to 4 needs an enzyme called cytochrome C. And because it's called cytochrome, it contains heme. So we need to learn about heme. Because if we don't learn about heme, we won't know the major components of what the build-up, what the nutrients are, which are going to uh, challenge her with. So this was the process that we went through. So we did that beautifully. Okay, so we'll come back to her and find out the answer to this a little later. So we're now going to look at hypoxia, which means a lack or low level of oxygen. It does not mean anoxia, which means no oxygen. It's well known that you can live for many, many weeks with no food. Maybe six weeks, maybe eight weeks, some of us could probably live longer. But you can only live about a week with no water. Okay. Maybe less, it depends on the weather, doesn't it? If we have weather like last week, we could probably only live a couple of days uh, with that sort of temperature and no water intake. Um, and, but we can only live for four minutes with no oxygen. So the ultimate nutrient in other words that the body needs is oxygen. So in the event of a coronary heart disease, a myocardial infarct, or a stroke, or an accident, we've got to get oxygen into that person. So we have to have resuscitation very quick. And because the lower, the longer we go on with lack of oxygen, the more damage occurs. And the damage primarily is not so much the asphyxia of lack of oxygen, it's the buildup of free radicals, or oxidated uh, reactive oxygen species, which do a lot of damage, particularly in the brain. Because the brain is largely made of unsaturated oils, they go rancid extremely quickly. So the danger is of getting hypoxia, or a lack of oxygen, which stimulates the production of reactive oxygen species. So hypoxia is a problem to almost everybody. And we used um, an oximeter, which is a very simple little machine that you can buy off Amazon, on the thumbnail, which measures the uh, quantity of oxygen in the capillaries in the there. But I've never yet found anybody who's shown to 100%. A lot of people show to 97, 98. Um, but what the books seem to indicate, it's only really a problem when the level of oxygen drops right down. And if that could be in the 80s. I have one patient who came in on the early 80s, and uh, she was actually on a ventilator machine, so she actually had a puff of oxygen, and psht, it went straight back up. But the majority of us is sort of 96, 97. But we don't show to being severe hypoxia, uh, although we don't show to be being particularly well. And the critical thing is when somebody shows the hypoxia with our muscle testing, particularly if they strengthen to oxygen, we've got to d try and forget about the blood and the lungs. This is the route through the lungs of getting oxygen to the blood, and the blood is the transporter to get it to the cell, but it's where it's working, where it's used in the mitochondria. So when a person strengthens to oxygen, we know that they're hypoxic. But it's where are they hypoxic, and the answer is in the mitochondria. So this is why you may have 96, 97% on the blood test with the oximeters, but be in acute hypoxic situation in the cells because you can't get the oxygen out of the hemoglobin and into the tissue in sufficient amounts because it has to cross the membrane of the red cell, it has to cross the membranes in the cells of the blood capillaries, it then has to cross the membrane of the cell it's going to go into, and then it's got to cross the mitochondrial membranes to get into the mitochondria. It's quite a long transport mechanism. And the only way oxygen gets from here to the cell in the end of your big toe or in the middle of your brain is by diffusion. It's simply a matter of the pressure here is greater than the pressure in the cell. And if the pressure is greater here than in your cell, oxygen will flow this way. 
And the same substance, the hemoglobin, which carries this in the blood, will transport carbon dioxide from the mitochondria back to the lungs to be breathed out. If the concentration of carbon dioxide is higher in the tissue than it is in the lung. So it's a reverse process. And the same carrying molecule, the same molecule carries both gases. Okay? So it's one way oxygen, the other way carbon dioxide. So it's a condition in which the body or a region of the body is deprived of ad ad adequate oxygen supply. So it can be generalized or local. Sometimes people just feel a bit lightheaded. Uh, they can get numbness and tingling of the extremities, nausea, tiredness, visual deterioration, memory loss, feeling the cold, degenerative changes. So very similar to obviously lack of energy because if we haven't got the oxygen, we also haven't got the lack of uh, ATP but we've got the added benefit of having a lot of free radicals probably being produced as well. Um, the most hungry oxygen tissue in the body is the brain. And the reason for that is that the number of mitochondria and neurons is anything up to 5,000. So this produces a, needs a lot of energy for the sodium pumps to work every time we depolarize a nerve. Each time nerves talk to each other, we have to pump sodium out and that takes an active process. So we need a lot of oxygen. And the most concentrated area in the brain is the cerebellum. There's more neurons per uh, square centimeter in the cubic centimeter in the cerebellum, which is called the little brain at the back of the head there, than anywhere else. And the cerebellum, its function is mainly vestibular mechanism to regulate all the muscles in the mechanoreceptor input from the whole of the body, and then to send impulses to the contralateral thalamus. So information goes ipsilaterally from the body to the same side cerebellum and then crosses over to the contralateral uh, thalamus. So there's a lot of connections in that cerebellum area. And there's more dense of density of, new, uh, of neurons than anywhere else in the body. So that is the first place that you see lack of oxygen. Okay, now you see this very frequently uh, if you keep fish and you forget to switch the aerator on. So if you forget to put the air on, the air, the oxygen in the water bubbles away, you go away for the weekend, and if you're lucky, the fish is on its side, or even upside down. Okay? And if it's not too late, you put the aerator back on, and it makes a miraculous recovery within a short time once it gets the oxygen. If it doesn't, you've got to fish it out the tank and do whatever you do with the fish. But that's a lack of oxygen. Okay? So when I was young, and this used to occur, we used to get goldfish in a bowl. We never had aerators. And from time to time, the fish would die or go on the side, and we didn't know what to do. So my dad used to give it a nip of brandy. He was a great believer that brandy would cure everything. And sometimes the fish would be revived with a drop of brandy in there. But I think it's because he took a deep breath of air, probably. <laughs> so basically, hypoxia um, is very common, but we see it in the brain and the brain function, first of all. So we'd see it in memory loss. We see it in uh, vestibular mechanism problems, vision, uh, tiredness, etc. Um, if it's rapid onset, of course, we may get lose balance, completely confusion, hallucinations, behavior changes, uh, papilledema, breathlessness, tachycardia, etc. Uh, if it's severe, a tissue may become gangrenous through lack of oxygen there, and extreme pain may also be felt at around the site eventually these late signs of bluing there, or cyanosis, slowing heart, hypertension. Uh, because hemoglobin is darker red when it is not bound to oxygen, or deoxyhemoglobin as opposed to the rich red color that it is where bound with oxygen, when seen through the skin it has an increased tendency to reflect blue back into the eye. So you get cyanosis if you haven't got enough oxygen. It's what they used to call a blue baby if you see it, or somebody blue with cold, is because the hemoglobin isn't carrying the oxygen around. So it can result from any stage of the delivery of oxygen from the lungs down into the tissues, um, through the blood system to the end result there. So functional testing, we often uh, do the phonocardiography where we listen to the heart and they're recorded on the phonocardia. And what we tend to find here is about 80% of our patients have reduced first sounds. And the majority of where the first sound should be twice the size of the second sound, or two and a half times, 
the majority of these cases uh, correspond to hypoxia or lack of oxygen. But of course, uh, a reduced first sound means that the ventricles are not contracting hard enough to pump an effective circulation, which will also lead to hypoxia. So in this situation, we may be that our muscles are not contracting enough in the ventricle, and then we would look at the nutrients. Perhaps we wouldn't be surprised if the nutrients came up would be the calcium-magnesium ratio and the potassium-sodium. Uh, okay, so blood levels of oxygen, as we said, have to be quite low to develop symptoms. And they say about 80% may compromise organ function, such as the brain and the heart. So it's got to be quite low before we get serious problems. But most of our people have serious problems with oxygen, but they show on the oximeter, they show at 96, 97. Because what we really got to be looking at is the oxygen pressure actually in the mitochondria itself. So the percentage of oxygen is known as the SATs or the saturation of the blood, which is what they measure in emergency situations. Um, around 90% of the value varies upon of oxygen saturation increases according to the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curves. So here we see the curve uh, when we start to get to 90% here. And it's really when we get only to about 80% that our hemoglobin is really in trouble. Yeah. So the pulse oximeter, which you can buy, <coughs> is quite a good general sort of measurement, but don't rely upon it as what's happening actually in the cell. It simply tells you the level in the hemoglobin. Uh, but it will give you a reading, and uh, it also gives you the pulse rate. So functional testing for somebody's hypoxia, um, might be that the patient comes in with all muscles weak on testing. So this occurs sometimes, you put the patient down, and then every muscle that you test, tests weak. And you think, well, what's going on here? And most of the time, if you put the oxygen vial on, well, they strengthen, all muscles will strengthen. And very frequently it's magnesium. Sometimes it may be lack of water. Uh, but very frequently it's magnesium. But it's certainly oxygen is involved in. A single muscle weakens on repeated muscle testing. This is an aerobic challenge. So we do a repetitive muscle test once a second. So you do it about 10 times, and then you test the muscle. And if the muscle goes weak, this is an aerobic challenge, which means they're not getting enough oxygen into the tissue. Uh, positive position, eye positions into distortion up and down. So this is where we go up, down, up, down, three or four times. And if this weakens the person, this may again indicate uh, using the eyes into distortion, a lack of oxygen. A weak muscle strengthens, of course, to oxygen. We use O2 uh, in a vial. You could, some people, you actually have a little cylinder of oxygen and measure it by giving the person a whiff of oxygen. But we use the, uh, the vial of the oxygen there. And if a weak muscle strengthens or any weakness strengthens the oxygen, well, then the person is probably hypoxic. And a strong muscle weakens to carbon dioxide because they're getting a relative high buildup of carbon monoxide, and or xanthine oxidase, which is an enzyme um, which uh, uh, inhibits the production of oxygen and water in the mitochondria. So patient protocol basically for hypoxia would weakness um, strengthens or a strong muscle weakens the hypoxic eye positions up and down, confirm using the oxygen vial to strengthen, and then challenge with the three following compounds. Um, so the first compound would be phospholipids. So phospholipids are the membranes that allow the oxygen to get across the alveolar, across the blood vessel walls, uh, into the red corpuscles, and then out of the red corpuscles, out of the capillaries, and into the tissue, across the membrane of the tissue itself that needs it, and then across the membrane of the mitochondria. So we need fatty acids to do that. And these fatty acids are both saturated and unsaturated. So the person may then show to evening primrose, black currant seed borage, or any of the culinary oils here. Um, when we look at hemoglobin, which we'll do in a minute, we'll look at ALA, uh, PBG, uroporphenogen, coproporphenogen, and protoporphenogen. These are the in-between substances of making heme. And when we're in the mitochondria itself, we test them for coenzyme Q10 to transport the electrons from complex 1, 2 to number 3. 
So these will be the following three things you test. So the quick way of getting into a person's hypoxia, do they strengthen to oxygen? If they do, test them with the phospholipids, test them with hemoglobin, test them with CoQ10. So that gives you the sort of three areas very quickly. So just as a, in brief, oxygen in the air has to get into the red cell, has to get to the tissue, has to get to the mitochondria of the tissue, and in one route it has to cross all these membranes. And all these membranes are made of oils. So if we haven't got the right balance of oils, that we've got too many trans fats in there, too much hydrogenated vegetable oils, and uh, uh, rancid oils, oxidized oils, oils that have gone off, this wouldn't be good at all.